audience welcome to the show power chat in today's episode we'll be discussing on combating hunger and poverty joining me today is mr pierre ferrari president and ceo at hafer international please allow me to welcome him welcome to the show mr ferrari thank you very much laxman how very have you been very well thank you well you have been visiting nepal uh, for a long time i have uh, could you tell us your impression over nepal's uh, development and diversity. Yeah, uh, so I came here about six years ago and uh, the, I've seen a lot of improvements over the past uh, six years in the work that we do. Uh, but Nepal as a country is, you know, I, I don't have to tell your audience, they know it well, but it's a beautiful country. And uh, I tell all of my colleagues all over the world that uh, the Nepali people are very sweet, loving people and hardworking. Um, so my impression is that with the work that if everybody can pull together, I think poverty and hunger can be conquered here. And it's been shrinking. I mean, things, things are getting better. Um, so it's, it's a place that has a special, uh, special niche in my heart. Uh, I really like it very much. What are the changes you noticed during the last six years? Yeah. You have been here. Well, I think, uh, you know, aside from the disasters like the quake and the floods and everything else, um, there's clearly a change in infrastructure. Uh, a positive change. I've noticed, for example, these are small changes, but they're important. You notice that there is uh, more water availability. You notice, for example, that you have more internet access, uh, including 3G network access in many more locations than before. All that helps. Um, and then you, you get a sense, generally, that the economy has been growing. Uh, that the demand for, for goods and services is growing. Um, there's a... There's a there's a small tick up every year, and uh, that's all very encouraging. So, yeah, things are improving. Well, uh, Heifer International, the organization that you are leading yeah. globally, it's, it's already been two decades that Heifer International established its office here in Nepal. Yeah. How do you assess the accomplishment of your work, mm. that of the global mandate in combating hunger yeah. and poverty in relation to your organization's presence here in Nepal? Yeah. We have a very specific measure. We, uh, we use this um, output tool or output measure called living income, which is a measure that we've developed along with some other nonprofit organizations and the UN and the World Bank on what it is that actually allows people to live a life of dignity. So this is not just the World Bank poverty level, it's actually higher <coughs> to make sure the individual family can actually afford education, a balanced diet, a nutritious diet, clothing, housing, etc. So we have made substantial improvements on that measure with the communities that we work. That's one thing. The other important component is the number of people we work with. So when we started 20 years ago, although we do have evidence and photographs to show that we actually delivered animals in Nepal in 1957, so we would go back 60 years, uh, but 20 years ago is when we actually licensed uh, to operate in. And so we have worked with very small groups to begin with back in 1997. And uh, now we work with very large groups. We've, we're engaged in one project with 138,000 families, which if you multiply out is well over 600,000 people, which in the context of the total population of Nepal is still small, but, but nonetheless significant. So two measures. One is the number of people we work with at scale so that we can actually have an influence where we work. And the other one is this living income idea. So we can raise income among smallholder farmers who represent in general the poorest people in Nepal. The poorest of the poor tend to be rural, er rural farmers, well farmers in far away rural areas. That's where we work, that's what we do. So we wanna take these folks who are generally isolated and perhaps ignored and have very little voice in either the political process or the economic process. So we try to make them, we try to give them voice and activity in the economy. Because without that, they will be ignored, they will be isolated, and then you're gonna have, I mean, a serious problem of deeply poor, extremely poor people who simply can't escape poverty. Do you think that the poverty level has been decreased due to uh, presence of Heifer International here in Nepal? I think where we work, yes, we have, we have good evidence to show that we can take people who are earning, you know, maybe 40, 50,000 rupees a year as a family, and we can take them up to 300,000 rupees a year. That is changing their lives. 
And we do this by connecting them, but plus of all, very importantly, is developing their ability and their confidence in themselves that they can actually work hard with the technical knowledge that we're providing to them and some of the animals that we're providing and they can escape poverty through their own hard work. You know, we do a little bit, there's no question. But the fundamental change is in their mindsets, right? In their mind, in their heart, and then they can escape poverty. Could you also tell us the major changes that have taken place here? Yeah. Due to presence of your organization. So I think right now we're in this, we're working on a goat value chain, right? Where the, herb, the, the rural population in, 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 uh, in Nepal is obviously producing a lot of goats and they're selling some goats, but in ways that are very informal and generally very disadvantageous to them. So we're organizing, and we've done a very good job, I think, of organizing large number of farmers, 138,000 I mentioned, into small groups and then co-ops and then unions of co-ops so that we can connect these large numbers of farmers to the market in a way that's beneficial to them. So instead of earning, you know, um, 80, 90 dollars per goat, they can earn 120 or more. That changes their lives. Not only that, but we can also show that with the technical knowledge we provide them, they can grow goats that are actually substantially heavier, you know, weight more, uh, sell for better pricing, etc. And we can show them how to do that at a much lower cost. So it, the mindset, I'm, I keep going back to the mindset, the mindset is to shift their thinking about goats from just being an asset that they can sell when they need to, to actually becoming business people who are goat farmers. And that's what we do. That's what we do. Well, uh, could you also tell us how Heifer International works here in Nepal? What are the major areas of interventions right. in development. So we have, we have an office in Kathmandu and then we have four district offices, although I think we're going to go down to three district offices for reasons, for, for organizational reasons. So these district offices and our staff then work with local NGOs, local active community-based organizations that then educate um, the population we work with on two principal, actually three principal areas. The first one is to manage and encourage them to think of themselves and their communities as not hopeless, but hopeful. That psychological change is in our mind, in the, in the HEFA model worldwide, the principal work that we do. Because I think we, know, we all know people who have resources, but they simply don't have the energy or they're psychologically depressed, or there's something lacking in their energy and their view of the world. And unfortunately, a lot of the communities we go to, which are very poor in the rural areas, tend to see the world that way. It's, it's fate, you know, it's karma. It's, it's something that simply cannot be beaten. So we say, well, that's not true. We essentially tell them that's not true. Let's show you how, with some thinking about your, your current state, you can actually escape that psychological state, right? It's a mind shift. Now, once that happens, and we have a whole procedure on how to do that, we call it values-based holistic community development. We form groups, we do teaching, we have a whole approach that takes a long time. Then we go into the technical change, placing the animals, training them how to feed the animals, how to keep the animals healthy, how to take them to market, et cetera, et cetera. So those two pieces is what makes how we work. And right now, as I've said, we've got several projects going on, but the, the principal project is the goat value chain, which is a huge business in Nepal, and how to organize these smallholder farmers so that they can connect to the market. Right here, yesterday we were at the market here in Kathmandu uh, in preparation for the, for the festivities, the festivals, and we, are sh we have one co-op in Banki shipping large numbers of goats from the rural, from the very smallholder farmers. So farmers who have, you know, five, six goats are organized in these co-ops and able to ship to Kathmandu through this whole process. So they've connected to markets. We've integrated them with the market now. That's what we do. Well, yeah. how are you working with the organizations here, including that of the governments yeah. and other community-based organizations? Yeah. We, we very much work at the grassroots, right? Uh, and the f so the first the first step is that <coughs> first of all all of our all of our employees are Nepali they're all nationals so you don't have somebody from America coming in and telling them what to do they are very self reliant and we trust their judgment because they are from Nepal and they know what goes on in Nepal that's the first thing the second thing is that we work with lots of local communities community organizations that also know the local conditions 
Because we do all that at the very local level, we have very strong, cordial, and very productive and participatory and partnership arrangements with local government, whether it be the district council, village council, etc. That has been a huge support for us. At the local level, government, and because the people are connected to government, right? There is, it's not uh, some faraway place in, in the highlands of Nepal trying to talk to somebody in Kathmandu. This is local, local, everybody's local. And that allows us to align the resources we bring to the situation and then the village and other people's resources to the same situation. So there's unification of effort, which means something real can happen. And so what you see is a, is a center like we have in Banki. I've just, as I said, I've just returned from there where we have a collection center, we have a truck operating. Now suddenly you've got a business that's partly funded by us, partly funded by the farmers themselves, which is very important because they feel committed, and then the local community, the local, the local uh, uh, government officials. Mostly your works are delivered or meant to farmers. We are all about farming not just animals, but mostly animals, but we, we do vegetable, we do everything, but our fundamental role right now in Nepal is dairy and goats. Could you also tell us how Hefe International started? It has interesting history. Yeah, I so it was, yeah, it was started by a man called Dan West, who is a was a dairy farmer. Uh, so he was a volunteer uh, missionary uh, supporting the refugees during the Spanish Civil War, which is back in the 1930s in Europe. So his, his commitment, he was out there feeding the refugees. He said, you know, we're giving away milk. What these people really need is a cow. So that idea of actually placing an asset with some training is what motivates us today. We, we essentially do that in a much more elaborate, complicated way now, but essentially that's what it. And of course, the idea is that if you place an asset, the, the farmers or the people can be trained in taking care of a cow, for example, and so how you feed it, how you, how you manage the health, and et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you can drink the milk and you can sell the milk. So that simple idea, right? It's a very simple idea when you think about it and very relevant to the developing world, if you think about it, because there's livestock everywhere, uh, is, what, is what we do. Wow. Yeah. I would like to ask you on the general development work yeah. in relation to international agencies' presence here in Nepal. Yeah. How difficult or easy for development organizations to work in uh, the communities like Nepal? Yeah. We are in a post-conflict situation. There are a yeah. lot of things that need to be settled. Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, could you tell us your experience working in Nepal? Yeah. So, again, I'll, I'll remind you that all of our staff is Nepali. So we have a sensitivity and a sensibility and understanding of the situation that I think perhaps some other organization don't have because we completely trust their judgment and their, their integration, obviously, with, with the community. And we've talked a little bit about post-conflict. Now, we have lots of stories where we were working during conflict itself uh, with, with, the, with the Maoists up in the mountains and everything else. We have lots of stories because we are so grassroots and so community-based in our work, we don't come in with solutions from the outside. We come in from up, coming up from the, from the grassroots, from the ground up. That during the conflict, there was a lot of push out by some of the uh, protagonists. We don't want international NGOs here. They, they damage the, the culture. And there was a lot of criticism and uh, expectations that they should leave. Our communities where we were working, who were also told to push Heifer out, said no, Heifer is actually helping us. We want Heifer here to continue helping us to do what needs to be done. So yes, there was conflict, it is post-conflict, but we don't involve in that because we're, we're part of the community. It's, it's a very different mindset. So we're not engaged in the political play, we're not engaged in all that. We're just, we work and I live with the farmers. You mean that uh, you're uh, activities or works were never uh, disturbed. There were no they hostile were environment disturbed. here in Nepal. They never disturbed. I know it's difficult to believe sometimes, but they were not. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's already two decades. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. A few days ago, you were celebrating the presence of two decades yeah. of Hefe International here in Nepal. Mm -hmm. How do you assess the impact of Hefe International work here in Nepal? Yeah. Do you well, think that the poverty level is significantly decreased? So where we work, 
Right? It, where we work, yes, we have significantly, actually, I, frankly, I would use the word eliminated poverty where we work. You go, and I would encourage you at some point to go and see the communities where we work, and you will see the elimination of poverty. So you'll see, and the way we measure it is through this living income idea. Nutrition is improved, both in terms of total calories as well as micronutrients and protein. Housing is improved. Clothing has improved. Most importantly, the educational level has improved. In fact, we have one, um, one woman, just as an example, was a, a farmer, a smallholder farmer. She had maybe three, three goats when we got there. We taught her how to raise the goats properly, feed the goats, etc. So she actually built a business. So she was able to escape that. And because she's got leadership skills, she became the leader of the savings group. Then she became leader of the co-op. And today, she's one of your parliamentarians. So she moved from a very remote farming community to becoming one of your political leaders. That's the kind of change we create. Yeah. Well, there is sometimes criticism that the resources are not properly utilized. Yeah. How, how do you check or how do you monitor the yeah. delivery of your programs yeah. at the grassroots level? So we have, so the total uh, overhead expenses in Hefe Nepal is about 10%. That's what we, and you need an infrastructure for finance, human resources, transportation, etc. So all of that, that's basically what we pay. Well, the rest of the resources go into the staff that works with the communities, the training, the animals, etc. All of that actually touches the people in the field. That's, that's how we, and we are, we have a, we at Heifer, this is now a global system, uh, monitor expenses very, very carefully. Um, and we have a level of independence for the finance group at Hefe, uh, the Heifer Nepal offices that reports, essentially reports directly to the finance group back in headquarters. So that's the way we have, we all do audits every year. We're very, very, very careful and very uh, disciplined about managing those expenses. Well, w what are your suggestions uh, for Nepal to invest upon, yeah. especially that of both the infrastructure and human development? I think infrastructure is important. Um, when you think about, and that, that's, I'm not going to say anything really new here because I think it's well understood. I don't know if it's being done. But for our farmers, and again, I'll just use this example, recent example of being in the Banki district. The road from Banki, um, from the Palbanj, all the way to Kathmandu, is a really important connector for the market, for the farmers down there to actually sell goats. So, you know, we, the farmers there are competing against uh, goats from India. There's absolutely no reason why Nepal should import goats from India. None. The farmers in Nepal can produce all the goats that are needed here. But the system is such that it's allowed this importation to happen when, in fact, with a little organization on the part of our part and part of the government to support it, we could get all of that substituted with Nepali goat. But we need good infrastructure. Yeah, and we need electricity and we need water. Because if you go across the border, south of the border, and you look at the way they're raising their goats, you know, they've got more infrastructure and that's helping them. So to compete, and we are competing now, uh, we're competing in terms of quality of the goats, pricing of the goats, uh, both quality, quality in terms of um, the amount of meat per goat and the quality and the taste of the goat. Uh, we know we can win. We, but so to answer your question, infrastructure is an important one. Electricity is important. Because if you, if you think about a modern um, meat value chain, right, from, from the farmer all the way to market, you, you're going to need electricity so that you can have refrigeration. That's going to be needed. And there's simply not enough electricity right now. So for us to have a good enabling environment, for us to do the work that we do to, to allow farmers to escape and to organize, I would say that's the principal thing. And water is an important thing. So it's water, electricity, and roads. <laughs> How do you see the issues of empowerment here in Nepal with, with uh, relation to your work? Yeah. So women's empowerment in particular, let me pick that subject up. We've got, a, as I said, we've got one project right now, an important project called, um, well, it's, all, it's 138,000 farmers. All of them, all of them, are women. So we have formed over 200 co-ops all led by women. We have unions all led by women. The importance of having women-led organizations cannot be overemphasized because that level of empowerment 
allows half the population and half of the energy, half of the entrepreneurial activity and spirit that exists to help Nepal out of poverty. So our principal product, our principal service to the communities is actually to get that to happen. How do we get women to come out of the house? How do we get women to have conversations in the village, eliminate caste? Because we'll have the Brahmins sitting down with the Dalits in the meeting together now. This is, doesn't happen normally. They actually will meet together, eat together, drink from the same uh, you know, uh, teapot, etc. That, that is one of the things we do. That's empowerment. It actually empowers the whole village to understand that working collectively for the benefit of everyone there, that's empowerment. Because by themselves, the very poor farmer cannot do very much. Cannot do very much. Well, Mr. Ferrari, do you, is it possible uh, to see world without hunger and poverty? What should be done to eradicate or combat uh, right. global poverty and hunger? So I think extreme hunger and extreme poverty can be eliminated globally. I think you're going to have military, political, climatic things which are going to create, uh, in, if, you, if you believe, which I do, in climate change, I think you're going to get to see globally, you know, some damage constantly, you're going to see some damage, and I think that's going to be tough to eradicate, because when people, when several million people are being displaced because of some climatic or, or even, say, a situation like you have with the Rohingya in, 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 in Bangladesh and, uh, and Myanmar, I don't know how you stop that. But in terms of everyday functioning economy, I think we can eradicate poverty. And the principal thing is to take a perspective that the poor, uh, that especially agricultural development, does not necessarily have to be led by large agricultural enterprises. That that dominant narrative, I think, is flawed. It's not completely wrong. I think large agricultural practices and development has a role, but we have to find a way, and we think we have done that, found a way to mobilize large number of smallholder farmers who enjoy farming, and through good training and scaling and infrastructure can actually be engaged and organized to feed the world, feed themselves, and actually cool the planet. So that's well, my vision. Well, uh, Mr. Ferrari, we are coming to the end of the show. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to say to our audience that I have left to ask you um, very quickly? No, I, I just think that um, I want to say one thing. As, as uh, we work and as other people work in, in Nepal, uh, I would pay attention, I would ask your audience to pay attention where they buy their products. So it's important, for example, during this festival time that people think about asking, well, does this goat come from India or does it come from Nepal? I think it's important for a country to be sovereign in their food. And if the consumer people like your audience say, I would like to buy Nepalese goat, I would like to buy Nepalese milk, I would like to buy Nepalese um, chicken. I think it, that helps a lot because that can develop the local economy, which I think ultimately s uh, supports everybody. Well, Mr. Ferrari, thanks for joining us. It was a pleasure you. talking to you. Pleasure talking to you, sir. Thank you. Dear audience, time now to wrap up the show. Keep watching us. See you next week. Namaste. Namaste.